Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 478. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. And I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's January the 21st, the Feast of St. Agnes the Martyr. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Let's get our viewers up to speed in audience participation. I'm going to go through this quickly. Please like the program. Please share the program. Please go to YouTube and comment on the program. Please subscribe to the pro program if you're not subscribed. And if you want to listen and not just look at our beautiful faces, the three geezers, you can go and listen to the podcast. You can find that address in the show notes. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. I want to let you know right now, things may be a little slow because it's three degrees outside. I'm sure that affects internet speeds. It's certainly affecting how fast I can think. We've been watching with great uh, uh, shot, what's the word, schadenfreude, the uh, weather situation in the far north. Mm. We're about 20 degrees below normal as well. The cold front is across the United States. It's uh, Even down in Miami, it's in the uh, 50s. So it's that, well passed. There's a funny picture going around on the on Facebook showing a, a Florida weathercaster, and he uh, they shows on the screen 56 degrees, and he has a stern warning, and it says dress in layers. And I was like, oh. <laughs> perspective, perspective, not always what you see. How's the weather over there, jo uh, Gavin? Oh, it's just really beautiful. There's a a poet who wrote about the way in which in January the world seems to fall asleep for a moment. And in the last week we've had this 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 lovely I think I'm gonna sneeze, which isn't gonna help matters. That's right. Go ahead. We have a sneeze lovely, button. Go for it. <laughs> a, a beautiful quiet atmosphere where there's been no wind, no no rain, the temperature's a bit damp, but it does feel like the world's asleep and waiting to be to ask to be reborn. Um, there'll be a few difficulties between February and March in the meantime, but but, but rebirth is never an easy matter. <laughs> no, that's true. All right. So George has a cold. Gavin's on and off sneezing. I'm recovering from a cold, so I have my really deep voice on. You just have to forgive us all that. I'll edit out any uh, mistakes or cough or loud noises. And, uh, and, and Kevin, if I also may interject, yes. we've been in our pre-shows, we've been talking about some very heavy, very theologically... <laughs> uh, <clears throat> difficult topics so you, you you're, re, you're 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 watching three men who've just spent an hour talking about the difficulties of life satan uh heaven and hell and to be up at bright and airy immediately on it's difficult to make that switch so quickly it is it's monday we shouldn't be happy to do this however this is the chaos that's provided before us, so we're going to talk about it. The first thing we're we'll talking about is kind of the story heard around the world this last week. Uh, Nigeria has decided that they uh, want to appoint more bishops into Kenya, and I started getting signals of this first when I was at March for Life. A couple of Kenya priests came up and said, did you hear what Nigeria did? Then I was getting emails and some phone calls. Did you hear what Nigeria did? And there was a lot of fog and confusion. First, it was two bishops were appointed, then three bishops were appointed to Kenya, and then four bishops were appointed to Kenya and the ACNA. And I'm like, oh, this, is, this story is getting bad. I sent some... Um, uh, questions off to the ACNA, what did they know? We sent some questions off to Nigeria, no response there anywhere. So I thought for sure, George, you could help bring us up to speed because this is a multi-layer story because Kena is part of the ACNA and so far is, in my recollection, all Kena bishops are ACNA bishops. So That is correct. Here. The three dioceses, I believe, Diocese of the Trinity, based in Indianapolis, Cana East and Cana West, Julian Dobbs and Felix Orgy. And Diocese of the Trinity is non-geographic, and it is primarily diocese for Nigerian expatriates. Cana East, Cana West are typical Cana, uh, typical Acna dioceses with a cross-section of membership. The uh, House of Bishops of the Church of Nigeria met last week in, at the uh, Ibru Center in Agra Altar in the Delta region and appointed four suffragans for the Diocese of the Trinity. They did this without first notifying Cana or the ACNA College of Bishops. So when we had this press release from the Church of Nigeria, I took it to the ACNA press office and I said, you've got four new bishops. And they responded, no, we don't. Uh, 
And now they were not denying the validity of the appointments, but the College of Bishops of ACNA elects its College of Bishops. It doesn't have the Church of Nigeria add them to it. So the Church of Nigeria has um, the two issues here. The one is the process. The, the need for four suffragans for this diocese was not known to the College of Bishops of ACNA, nor apparently to the two other Cana bishops. And it comes across as a jobs for the boys in Nigeria. Here's a free ticket to the U.S. to be a bishop. Well, the what... second issue is that one of the four bishops is somebody who holds views contrary to Cana and Agnes tenets. Uh, Cana does not permit the ordination of women. He's a supporter of the ordination of women. He also is a believer and a preacher in the prosperity gospel and the word of faith movement. So this is, and for the Calvinists in Cana, this is beyond the pale. This is something else. Well, but I want to uh, do a little compare here. ACNA just had a meeting. Uh, of their college of bishops, where they brought in a couple of new bishops, but they did this things completely different. It's it, there's no people vouching for you. You have to provide documentation of your education and all this types of thing. I was pretty impressed by all that. Yes, Todd Atkinson uh, from uh, Lethbridge, Alberta, was brought on board as a bishop of the College of Bishops. I had received some communication from Anglican Network in Canada clergy concerned about his academic credentials, about the validity of his Episcopal orders, and about his theology, and what was the exact status of Via Apostolica, Apollos, his group of churches. Sure. And Cain Acna was very quick to come back saying, yes, we have documentation from Registrar at Oxford. He received a degree from this college. Uh, we had him, can, we regularized his orders, meaning the bishops who ordained him were Episcopoi Vagante, Episcopoi Vagantes. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And we needed, and so we regularized his orders, meaning we conditionally reordained him. They didn't use that word. I use that word. But his Episcopal orders are now okay. His education is certain. And his theology is vouched for by Charlie Masters. And only he has joined ACNA his congregations still have to prove, move through the synodical process for, for ANIC. So some people could say, well, they're really slow walking uh, Bishop Weirdbeard from the prairie. Uh, <laughs> but no, they're doing due diligence. Due diligence, yeah. Compared to <laughs> the college of bishops waking up saying, you got four new members, one of whom is a loon <laughs> well, now, from Nigeria. For people, for people who want to know more about that, we did an episode like two episodes ago. I'm going to put the episode number here because I don't remember, where we talked about culture in the church. And we talked about Nigerian culture. It would be a good refresher for you uh, to learn why would they do that. Well, it's all in that episode. Gavin, we're going to talk about some... Uh, uh, English news here, but I kind of want to set it up first. Mm. Today is Martin Luther King's uh, day, Junior's day, um, where we celebrate his great marches in the civil rights, bringing civil rights to the forefront, and bringing uh, peaceful marches and peace, peaceful demonstrations and doing things the right way to the forefront of American culture. Um, I hold him largely responsible for uh, normalizing some relations. There will always be um, hate in this world. There will always be all these bad things, but um, people like Martin Luther King Jr. helped a lot. But not everything is what it seems. It's kind of like the Wizard of Oz. You look behind the curtain. Because right now, if you asked anybody uh, on the street who was Martin Luther King, oh, he was a great liberal. He was an awesome person who wanted to bring um, uh, equal rights to everything, and uh, they they would totally mischaracterize who this man was. George, did you know he was a Republican? And Kevin, did you know that Bobby Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's Attorney General and the icon of the American left, had the FBI wiretap and investigate this guy? Uh, uh, Martin, Luther Martin Luther King was a man. He had his human failings, but he also spoke to the uh, moment and was a great American. I don't doubt uh, his worthiness in the pantheon of heroes, but it is the 
it is how these heroes have been transformed by the political currents of the day to meet fashionable agendas. Uh, it's well, why should we be surprised? That's well, just we're the not way surprised, politics works. It, everything is not what they seem. And the first thing this morning I woke up and clicked on, and Gavin sent me this interview with Archbishop Justin Welby, uh, a wonderful PR interview for um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lambeth, and how the church is doing wonderful things. And um, without disparaging Justin Welby, and not making this personal attacks, I thought we could talk about the interview, what it means, and what you're not seeing. What's behind the curtain? Kind of that Wizard of Oz thing. Don't look behind the curtain. Um, first, where, why did Justin do this interview, Gavin? Let me start in a slightly different place, <laughs> Kevin. If I may. Um, <clears throat> Kevin, if you, if you said to me, Gavin, are you charismatic? Uh, I would say, Kevin... I think every Christian should have as much of the Holy Spirit as possible, and there are certain gifts of the Holy Spirit which often don't matter as much as the fruit. And if you really press me, privately, probably more than publicly, though I recognize this is public, I would say, Kevin, the gift I've always prayed for is the gift of discernment. It's always <clears throat> seemed to me that as a Christian that's one of the things that would be most useful to the kingdom to have. Now, I, I mention this because the interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury has hit the public headlines here. Because one of the things he said early on in this half-hour interview, which I, I hope everyone will watch, is that he was a charismatic and at five o'clock every morning he spoke in tongues. This is a strange thing to make a priority uh, at the beginning of a very public interview. And I found myself wondering why he did it. Was it, was it just a slip of good taste? Was it a, a theological aberration or was it, was it a purpose? And of course, we know, in fact, that the Archbishop's office has a sophisticated group of journalists they've bought from Fleet Street. And this was an interview with something called Premier Radio, which is the one independent Christian radio station. And it's quite clearly meant to be a presentational piece. And the Archbishop laid out his, his wares, such as they were, beginning, strangely, with this declaration that he was a charismatic who spoke in tongues. Actually, anybody who's an observer of the charismatic movement knows that one of the real problems with it is the divisiveness of speaking in tongues, because immature charismatics used to say, this is the big deal, everyone must do this, or I do this. It was one of the ways in which you would most discredit the charismatic movement, which, of course, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, was so much more important than the gift of tongues. So why was the archbishop doing this? Um, it, it looks as though it was a uh, something of a PR piece in which he could lay out who he was and what he believed. And much of it was very good indeed. I was very impressed. I was certainly carried along with some of the lovely things he said. He talked, for example, about the campaign, Thy Kingdom Come, and said it encouraged every Christian to have a group of five people you prayed for to come to Christ. And lo and behold, in his experience, this was happening. People said, we've been praying for five people, they're coming to Christ. Immediately, any enthusiastic Christian listening to this has their heart warmed, uh, and one experiences a great deal of joy. The, the difficulty was, as the interview progressed, that although it was presented in a very heartwarming, uh, properly pietistic way, I, I felt increasingly, though, uncomfortable. And, and the source of the discomfort was what appeared on the surface and what lay underneath. So, so for example, uh, he talked about his journey to his visit to the TUC, and he defended it vigorously by, by looking at St. Luke's story of Zacharias. He said, here, Jesus goes anywhere, he takes the gospel anywhere at all, and, and he takes it to this man and he's converted, and he gives all his money away, isn't this amazing? So of course I went to the TUC, and I warned them I was going to talk about God. And you think, yo, that's right, Archbishop, you tell them, hooray. But, but then came the critical moment where any intelligent, theologically astute person would know this is, this is the hiccup. The hiccup is, what's the difference between personal transformation and political programs of redistribution. Well, let's remind people, when Jesus spoke with Zacchaeus, Zacharias and stuff like that, he did not condone their activity. He did not go in there and say, listen, guys, I love taxation. 
It is so awesome. And we need to continue taxation uh, to the ends of the earth. When Justin Welby went to the TUC, he went in there not as a person bringing uh, the spirit of God and a, a message of uh, repentance and stuff like that. He went in there to say, I'm one of you. I am a socialist like you. I believe in the policies you believe. It was. It's a different message than the comparison with uh, Zacchaeus. Well, he must know this. And so to present it as, as if he was the inheritor of a Bible encounter doing what Jesus did in the same circumstances was either a bit disingenuous or, or really very naive. And it is hard to believe he's that naive. Uh, next, he was asked whether about the transgender baptism stuff. And then he said, well, this was because we had a, a motion from General Synod, so we did what Synod asked, and we tried to find a way without changing doctrine of allowing people to express their new identity in Christ. Whoops, wait a moment. <laughs> there is no new identity in Christ. <laughs> he very carefully said, no change of doctrine, only one baptism, calming people down. But again, he would and should and, and really must have known that the theological arguments about using baptism to shore up a mental illness called gender dysphoria is more than just meeting the needs of a general synod agenda. He said some very wise things. He talked about um, the fact that charismatic movement shouldn't be coming, be, be seen as a tribal event, but by making so much of tongues, you wonder if he hadn't done exactly that. He talked about the way in which the church had a real difficulty about knowing what holiness was and how you dealt with people who fell far short. Well, we ourselves found that difficulty a couple of episodes ago. So all that was true. The, 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 I found myself saying at the end, history is lived forward, but understand understood backwards. The things that the Archbishop represents have been tried out already as a theological program in tech. Um, we know what they produce. They produce some very bad fruit. They produce uh, a dissolution of, of, of Christian belief and, uh, and schisms in the church. But meanwhile, he's saying, of course, I believe in drawing the church together. John 17 is my most important passage. This is wonderful. Um, so on the one hand, we have all this, 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 this piety, all of which is true and lovely. But if you know what he's doing underneath, it runs completely counter to it. And so I came away with a with great admiration for a piece of media presentation very well done, with, with joy for the gospel things that I heard, but with a very deep sense of being disturbed and feeling that somehow I'd had the wool pulled over my eyes, but I couldn't yet tell how and why. Well, how can somebody with so much or such a lack of spiritual discernment claim to be a charismatic? Uh, I know I got a lot of Calvinists who watch the show who are saying, well, this proves sensation. A sensationalist has been proved once for all watching the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, claim he's a charismatic. Well, he said one or two other things. I mean, again, they were odd. I mean, he said at one point, all, all Christians are full of the Holy Spirit. And I went to say, well, wait a minute. No, we're not. My daily prayer is, Lord, I have so little of the Spirit. I, I, I'm one of the poor. <laughs> As Jesus describes them in the Beatitudes, I'm one of the poor and I need more of the Spirit. The idea that all Christians are full of the Spirit. I mean, it must have been a slip of the tongue or else a misunderstanding of what the Holy Spirit is and what he looks like in people. If I, if I may jump in here. Please. Um, I, I want to... Uh, move beyond what I want to move. I want to place this television, uh, the radio broadcast into a wider perspective. I wasn't particularly shocked or amazed or uh, upset by what was said because it's entirely consistent with the agenda and the trajectory of the Church of England under Justin Welby. Uh, an anecdote, 25 years ago when I had my first parish, uh, I was in Sebastian, Florida, and Sebastian is a little town on the coast, and and I was teaching a course in the Holy Spirit, and, um, and at the same time we were building a parish hall, and my heart's desire was to have a tin roof so that we didn't have to have one of these pine shingle roofs like the Presbyterians across the street. <laughs> well, the junior warden of the parish was the local millionaire. He was uh, uh, an old Floridian with flat top crew cut, pointy cowboy boots, and he owned all the land that was being turned into housing tracks. 
And he came in in my office and said, George, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. And I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, tin roof. <laughs> and he said, Lord, George, the, Lord, the Spirit has told me to leave my wife and marry my secretary. Hmm. And I said, I believe a spirit has spoken to you, but not necessarily the Holy Spirit. Well, the spirit of the age. What? Well, the spirit of lust. Uh, what I, what I, where I, why I raise that story is, and it's actually true, and no, we never did get a tin roof, uh, was that people confuse vocabulary. Um, vocabulary is used by people, and they hear code words. They hear words that they think they agree with. And they're used, not, they're used at times not in the ways that the meaning behind the words should give. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Kevin, you mentioned the Calvinist heads are exploding, that the Archbishop of Canterbury is talking about speaking in tongues like clockwork at 5 a.m. <laughs> There's that passage in Romans we somehow miss, that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's like your bowels. At 5 a.m. they move. The Spirit moves at 5 a.m. every day. I'm being silly, but no, of course. the point that I'm trying to make is Justin Welby, has lost the Calvinists. The Calvinists are an insubstantial factor within the calculation of the Anglican Communion. But he needs to reach out to the charismatic movement who are not necessarily in favor or opposed to his agenda. If you recall, <clears throat> the charismatic movement in the Episcopal Church was part of the agenda towards accepting same-sex relationships. God is doing a new thing was the words Gene Robinson used at General Convention time and again, and Jack Spong. And we had charismatic Episcopalians, not all of them, but charismatic Curcio type Episcopalians in the 70s and 80s and 90s saying, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is telling us this new thing, which is that same sex genital relations can be holy and godly. Now, what they were not doing was they weren't applying scripture, they weren't applying tradition or reason or any of the things. They had a private word of knowledge, and they claimed this was from the Holy Spirit. Now, where I'm going with all this is that we need to put this in the wider context of the Christian world and the Anglican world. Justin Welby, I believe, good for him that he has said we should be nice to politicians. I agree we should pray for five people each day. All these wonderful things. But then I asked myself, where's the fruit of all of this work that he says that he's doing? What, what, why do we see a church where, if he's looking for unity, uh, Gavin, how many Anglo-Catholic traditionalists or conservative evangelicals have become deans, archdeacons, bishops in the last 10 years, excluding the flying bishops? None. Yeah. Apart, apart from the, uh, apart from the, uh, the flying bishops, they have all been excluded and, and not only that but but there's been a, a considerable movement to appoint homosexual deans over the last 20 years and and, and it has increased not decreased during justin wilby's tenure so what we're seeing uh, where, where i'm coming with this is that this is part of a wider i you would call it societal because we're seeing sort of the same thing in francis's leadership of the curia and the catholic church where we're abandoning the traditional standards, whether it's the magisterium in the Catholic Church or scripture, tradition, and reason in the Anglican way, for the private revelation and public and political uh, desires of autocrats. And don't, friends, don't be fooled. Justin Welby is an autocrat. Well, I'll give you a little example. The Anglican Center in Rome has been in the news recently. The former director was Bernard Nottatore. Now, I've known Bernard for 20 years. Bernard had been the Archbishop of Burundi, a Central African nation. Bernard was a political prisoner. He's an Oxford-educated man who was chief of staff to the former president of Burundi. And Bernard is a Tutsi, and there was a Hutu revolution sometime in the 80s, and he wound up in prison for a number of years, tortured, beaten, and so on and so forth. And he had a conversion experience and came out of his political uh, wilderness into full-time ministry and I always knew him to be a devout Christian, conservative on all the theological and moral issues, 
But because Burundi is a desperately poor country, beholden, beholden to the goodwill of mission societies in the Church of England. He's in charge. He's uh, moved out of office on a sexual misconduct charge that is going to be looked at and adjudicated according to the Church of England standards. Well, that's the Church of England is extending its standards now to the Church of Burundi, I guess. But and then he disappears, and in its place we have hard. Le we have a new hard left director, uh, Michael Burroughs, uh, bishop in Southern Ireland, supporter of abortion, supporter of gay marriage and gay rights, and then we have uh, John Shepherd as appointed the acting director, a hard left, sea of faith type Christian. Now, I thought the whole Don Cupid, Jack Spong Christianity, where, you know, God is just good intentions and feelings, and, and in every day and in every way we get better and better, that all died in the 70s. But the Sea of Faith movement has more influence within the centers of Lambeth Palace and the international corridors of Anglican Communion than the traditional Anglo-Catholics, conservative evangelicals, uh, charismatics, even regular middle-of-the-road Anglicans. What we're seeing is that each citadel of the enemy for Justin Welby is being besieged and replaced by people that support his agenda. So now the direct conduit between the Vatican and the Anglican world is a non-believer. He does not believe in a physical resurrection. You saw his defense of what he said, which it says, I believe in a spiritual resurrection. Well, that's not what the creeds say. He doesn't believe in a physical resurrection. And that's just fine with Lambeth Palace. Yeah, I, I got to say, you know, from what I hear about Francis, they deserve each other. And we see this. Um, see, what's, there's a bigger picture, and it's a consolidation of power. The Episcopal Church had been an anchor, a, a counterweight to the liberal movement in the Church of England, at times a support, at times a rival. Do you remember when Catherine Jeffrey Shorey went to Southwark Cathedral and because she wasn't recognized as a bishop in England, she, she, she processed holding her mitre in her hands. And the there will talk about the time from liberal Church of England members that we should join the Episcopal Communion, not the Anglican Communion. Well, Jeffrey Shorey, and you remember when she was presiding bishop, she did a big show of having all the national flags of anybody affiliated with the Episcopal Church up in the podium, that we are a world, but we, the Episcopal Church, are a global Anglican Communion as well. And you had the Brazilians and uh, the South Americans and Mexican, you know, people whose bills were being paid by 815 saying, yes, that's right. Well, the Episcopal Church has imploded. It no longer plays a substantial role on the international stage as an institution. Michael Curry's focus is on preventing the institution from falling apart. His focus is on evangelism. His focus is basically, let's string along the Bill Love stuff until everybody on the left forgets about it, and then we'll let Bill Love go away and lick his wounds, but we're not going to kill him today whereas Jeffrey Shorey would have sacrificed him immediately. So into the vacuum steps Justin Welby, and the English left, funded by the occasional American pocket of money, but no longer led by American leaders, is consolidating its power. So you see it in the Church of England's House of Bishops, that everybody in the last four or five years is a Welbyite mediocrity to a man or woman. You see it in the international Anglican institutions. Tabo Makoba, who is a, a uh, friend of the Sea of Faith movement, the Archbishop of Canterbury, is putting together the agenda for the Lambeth Conference. We see the, the conservative evangelicals and Anglo-Catholics in Africa, the Nigerians, the Ugandans, being frozen out. It doesn't matter that they're not showing up. This is all part of a concerted campaign to give Justin Welby's worldview center stage of the Anglican worldview. I think that's, that that's undoubtedly true, what you've described. And it's, it's mirrored by what's going on in England. So anecdotally, one of the things that's happened in England is when Justin Welby was appointed, there was enormous joy 
from the born again and from the evangelicals who said finally we have a we have a truly christian archbishop who will follow biblical norms and then it became confusing because the appointments that were made and the pronouncements of the appointments that were made uh, didn't reflect that and then something worse happened the people who are right on the cutting edge of, of radical progressive sexual politics uh, alan wilson bishop of oxford paul bays bishop of liverpool they seem to have completely free reign under Welby to say whatever they liked, whenever they liked, in order to push this agenda. But if you speak to Rod Thomas, well, you don't even need to speak to him. You need to, you need to see that he's been completely quiet. You look at the other uh, bishops who might have had a reputation for believing in biblical orthodoxy, they're completely quiet. So again, under Welby, what happens is those who speak out are radical, heterodox heretics. And those who have claimed some orthodoxy appear to be silenced. Now, they're silenced on the very good reason that uh, of cabinet solidarity. The way the House of Bishops has been run is you're only allowed to speak to the public if it's your responsibility, if you're lead bishop for this issue. But, but whatever the justification, the effect of it is that the orthodox are silenced and the heterodox are given loud hailers. Um, George's analysis is exactly right. What is said in public uh, is at, at complete odds with what is done politically. It, and this is a difficult for me because we're talking about a man now. But I was, Kevin and I, when Justin Welby came in, uh, we're very, we gave him the benefit of the doubt. We listened to his vocabulary, which was influenced by the uh, Alpha movement, and we heard all the right words and we were tempted. And with Kevin, everybody loves Kevin because he's a nice guy. Pure as the driven snow, is that right, Kevin? That's what I hear. <laughs> and but then a number of personal things that you know were personal, so therefore you really can't talk about them. But to me, to this day, Justin Welby's sacrifice of his mother's reputation uh, on the political altar, on the political altar that uh, his mother had an affair while she was engaged to her, his put his putative father. And Welby and the editors of the uh, newspapers that were investigating his bastardy you know, basically said to him, you know, we can kill this because this is not really a need to know story. And Welby fully cooperated and hung his mother out to dry as an adulteress. Then Welby's personal use of his daughter's problems with mental illness as a, another political stick, another uh, way to be... Uh, connected in one with the people, using those people whom he should have the obligation to protect and, you know, and to love and to support as parts of a campaign, I just found distasteful. But it's entirely in line with his management style. So what we have in this interview is just another piece. He's giving something to the undecideds to those evangelicals in the Church of England who still are holding on, thinking, well, if we just hold on a bit longer, look, he's saying the right words, he's saying things that make us feel warm and fuzzy. But they're not matched by any action. In fact, the actions are countermatched by further moves into darkness and destruction and to eventual dissolution of the Church of England as an institution, I believe. I think one of the things that caused me some anxiety was when he began to lay out his pitch for the 2020 report, Living in Love and Faith, because he had said some very useful things. He had said, you know, we mustn't do anything without referring to the Bible. We must uh, pray that we understand the Bible correctly because so many people have misinterpreted it in the past, all of which is true and wise. But but then he said, as for our, for our document, our big document on sex, we have drawn together the cleverest, the most informed, the best resourced people, and we're putting together in, in, them together in this great this great project. They're speaking together, and they will they will pronounce. And I think I wanted to say, what is there about the Bible and tradition and the mind of the church and the, our understanding of the Holy Spirit and sex and holiness that is not clear? already why would you need to gather all these people to launch this huge project unless what you were trying to do was to move the church in a different trajectory the one in which 
the, the saints and the apostles have always believed. And my great fear is that's what he's doing. But he will do it. He will do it without clarity. There won't be red lines crossed. There will be no change of official doctrine. There will simply be the promotion of a, of a different climate. Uh, and yeah, there we are. Go on, George. Where I find it difficult for me, and again, this is an emotional response. Uh, many uh, Christians in the UK, for instance, wonder why is Donald Trump so popular with American Christians, where he has overwhelming support. Well, I can't answer that in full, but one of the things that I think people in the UK should understand is that I don't think any Christian believes that Donald Trump holds himself up as a model of Christian virtue. He is the first to admit that he's a broken, fallen, sinful person who has messed up from time to time. So that when you hear his hyperbole, it doesn't, you know, you're not expecting everything that he does to be the best, but he's in the right direction. Justin Welby uses the same degree of hyperbole in his claims about the work of the Church of England, but he then adds the, the sheen of, and look at me as being a moral uh, pillar. Look at me. I speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit is working in my life. How dare you suggest otherwise? And what that says to me is that just like my story about the tin roof, a spirit is at work, but I don't think it's the Holy Spirit. Now, well, this, I, this is this is such a big issue because um, this is exactly the theological question, the the one that has been raised. Uh, I I read a piece um, which I'm thinking about trying to write about by by Colin Coward, who is one of the primary uh, exponents of of gay culture. Uh, I like Colin. He's a really sweet man. <laughs> I'm, I'm very fond of him. Um, but uh, I may I just interrupt? Kevin once sat in his lap in a taxi ride in Alexandria. <laughs> it was the opposite. Okay. He <laughs> sat in my lap for 60 blocks. <laughs> it was Colin who said, hello, sailor. Not, <laughs> not you. Okay. i just get that wrong. Um, I, I wonder if we mightn't even put, put Colin's piece up uh, so people can read it for themselves. Uh, he's a very lovely man, but he defines himself by his capacity for homosexual love. That's what the piece is all about. Uh, and he's very, he's, he's very happy that there's elements of Christianity that allow him the color and the drama and the pageant of religion uh, in a way that allows his discovery of homosexual love and his self-identity a place. And he's very cross with those elements of Christianity that deny it to him. And so it's very clear in Colin's piece that there are two kinds of Christianity, two versions of holiness, one to do with his own uh, self-understanding and sexual identity, and that other one. Well, the trouble is that other one is the one of the saints and, uh, and, and the believers down the ages found in Scripture and, and in tradition. And so exactly within Colin's piece, you have this dichotomy. Now, in a softer and less articulated way, this is exactly what the Archbishop of Canterbury is doing too. So I, I was saying that this report, this this blog by Colin Coward, uh, gives us exactly the dichotomy that we are talking about. As we asked the question George raised as to which is the Holy Spirit uh, and which, which is the, the unholy spirit. Interestingly enough, uh, we have something of an answer already politically to that in terms of Lambeth Palace, because I'm not the only one to, to, to like and talk to Colin Coward. Um, we know that, that Canon Porter, who is Archbishop Welby's right-hand man and fixer, had a conversation with Colin Coward several years ago. Colin was delighted by it because Colin leaked it very, very foolishly. And what he said was that, that, that Porter, speaking on Welby's behalf, said they were quite prepared to lose a certain proportion of the Church of England over the gay issue. because They recognised it was inevitable, but they were prepared to do it because of their commitment to this progressive, uh, this, this progressive view of sexual ethics. Um, now, what Welby is trying to do at the moment um, is to minimise the number they lose. And I think probably that's the key to understanding the PR, uh, the PR um, value of the piece he's just done. Uh, Colin told the truth. Uh, Porter tells us the mind of, of Lambeth. Uh, it hasn't changed because the whole trajectory of everything that's been done politically continues along those lines. I think George raises exactly the right question. <clears throat> we know what the Holy Spirit looks like uh, in these matters. If people take an opposing view, uh, it can't be the Holy Spirit. It's an issue for me of integrity as well. 
uh, we, we've complimented Colin Coward for being a delightful person, but he's also a man of integrity and in that he says what he believes. He doesn't mm. shade it to match the opinions of the day. And what we're seeing from the Archbishop of Canterbury is almost the opposite, that he, sh he uses the vocabulary and language of his audience to bring them on side, but then pushes his private personal agenda forward, often in times in contradiction to the language he's just used. He is not a man of integrity. Well, with that, guys, we've hit about 40 minutes of wonderful time that our audience gets to listen to Anglican Unscripted. We appreciate you guys sitting with us uh, for this time. Like we said, it was a heady discussion for Monday. I can't believe we got through it. Uh, before we move on, I referred to it in the beginning. I refer to it again. Like the show. Comment all the time you can in YouTube. Share with your friends. Um, do what you can. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and you've been listening to episode 478 on the fourth day of the week of prayer for true Christian unity. Mm -hmm.